So I recently made a video discussing a possible link between gender dysphoria and autism inspired by a certain children author's transphobic manifesto, and I'll link that below because I'm really proud of it. So I did a really deep dive on one sentence of the manifesto, and I was like, that's it, that's all I'm going to talk about, I've said my piece. But then I, I looked up, literally, to the paragraph just above it, and I want to talk about that too. So welcome to a new series, I guess. So the author says that part of her concern about transgender people existing is the large number of young women who mistakenly identify as trans, take medical steps to transition, and then realize that they were women all along, being left with irreversible changes such as loss of fertility. And very similarly to the autism argument, this is a really common talking point amongst transphobes. The author's statement to the untrained eye may not seem all that hateful, but it's full of dog whistles like these that both trans people and transphobes alike can recognize. The trans community doesn't talk about detransitioners a lot, and I get why. The conversation is really often used to argue for the rollback of trans rights, so I completely understand that people just like don't want to touch that conversation. But since trans people tend not to talk about detransitioners, the conversation gets to be dominated by transphobes. So if you're just a well-meaning parent whose child has just come out as trans, and you just want to Google this detransition thing because you heard someone talk about it, you are going to get railroaded into a bunch of transphobic places, because no one else is really talking about it. And so, I want to contribute to this conversation and talk about detransitioners from a trans perspective. I'm also going to try and make this a compassionate and well-researched perspective. I really don't want this video coming across as me hating the people who detransition themselves or calling them transphobic. I 100% support everyone doing what they want to with their body, which includes stopping a medical treatment if it's not serving you. Detransitioners made a mistake when they were trying to figure themselves out, and we've all been there. Trust me. I thought I was going to be a professional skateboarder. <laughs> Instead, my problem is with the people who use stories of detransitioners to push a transphobic agenda. Some of these people are detransitioners themselves, but the vast majority of them are cis and have always identified as cis. And so, we're going to begin by looking at the narrative of detransitioners. What kind of stories are being told, and how do these stories support a certain agenda? Then I'll be looking at the facts. How many people actually detransition, and why? What are the most common reasons for people to detransition? And is it really as huge of a problem as we're being led to believe by this statement? And then finally, we'll be looking at solutions. How do we decrease the number of detransitioners and make sure that everybody is in the body that feels right for them? So let's get started. <laughs> So in doing research for this video, I looked at stories of detransition and the ones that are most likely being told by the British press. And there's a very specific kind of detransition story that's told. Most of the stories are about people who took medical steps to transition, I guess because it's easier to make a sensationalist argument out of I cut my breasts off but I want to be a woman again than I cut my hair short and I, th I then realised I preferred having it long. Most of the concern is about kids or people who transitioned when they were still young. It's always a story of a cis person mistakenly identifying as trans, even though that is not the only reason for detransition. It's also usually about women or people assigned female at birth as opposed to men or people assigned male at birth, because the author isn't just any old transphobe, right? She's not a conservative, she's not homophobic, she's a feminist. She actually seems to agree with a lot of radical feminism, and she sure does seem to exclude trans- At this point in the experiment, I had to be subdued. And so, trans women are painted as these predators who transition in order to creep on women and invade women-only spaces, whereas trans men are these poor, misled, misguided women. It's very interesting how different trans women and trans men are in the minds of transphobes, considering that the most simple explanation is just that they're both trans and go through the same thing. Focusing on women and AFAB people allows the author to make this point about fertility. In a lot of radical feminism, the ability to bear children is given a lot of importance and is one of the defining aspects of womanhood. Let's not forget that this whole mess started because of a tweet about menstruation. So this is why the focus is on AFAB people instead of AMAP people. Their bodies and fertility can be used to craft a narrative of vulnerability, violation, and desecration. So all of these aspects, them being young, them being women, come together to create a narrative of vulnerable people being tricked into transitioning by the powerful trans lobby. Transphobes are very into this idea that the trans community wants to convince cis people that they're actually trans and force them to transition, 
and I've never quite worked out why we would want to do that. However, the story of detransitioners seems to support this. Cis people thought they were trans because everyone told them they were and forced them to transition and then they changed their mind. Essentially, detransitioners support the narrative that medical transition is pushed on people too fast. While a lot of the trans community is pushing to make access to medical transition easier, some people are arguing it has to be made harder, and detransitioners are a key part of this argument. If some people thought they were trans and then went on hormones and it turned out they weren't trans, then maybe that's proof that some people are being prescribed hormones without the proper vetting process and we have to make it a lot harder so that nobody else makes any mistakes. I'm not claiming that any of these people are lying about their experiences or that they don't exist. I'm sure there are young women who took medical steps to transition and then realized they still identified as women, but I don't think that these stories are being told proportionally. True stories can still be used to craft certain narratives. We have to ask ourselves why this story is being told and what other stories are being ignored. So why are these the stories being told. I think it comes down to pity. Cis people feel a lot of pity for people who thought they were trans and then it turned out they weren't, especially if it's a young, innocent woman. And honestly, I do too. But it's a very interesting phenomenon, because if you feel pity for a detransitioner, then you're saying and acknowledging that having a body that doesn't fit your desired gender expression is a bad thing. And like, we know. <laughs> That's kind of what being trans is all about. Being a man with sucks, whether you're a trans guy or a cis man who took estrogen for a while. We're not so different, you and I. This is the fun part, the statistics. I never thought I'd say that. So how many people detransition, really? Is it a huge problem we should be worrying about? The World Professional Association for Transgender Health say that around 0.3% of people who had transition-related surgery later requested detransition-related surgical care. Stonewall reported that less than 1% of the people served by the NHS Gender Identity Service regretted their transition. A Swedish study found that 2% of the patients at a particular clinic had feelings of regret following their sex reassignment surgery. The National Center for Transgender Equality surveyed nearly 28,000 trans people and only 8% reported detransitioning. This is the highest number I could find that was from a reputable source and even that is a lot more complicated than at first looks, which we'll get to later. It's important to note that all of these numbers are measuring slightly different things. Some are looking at specifically surgical revision, others are looking at general feelings of regret, and so it's really hard to compare them and make any actual definitive claim about how many people detransition. However, it really doesn't seem to be that many. When you consider how few people are trans in the first place, this becomes a truly minuscule proportion of the real population but it's not zero, and I'm not trying to pretend it is. But I don't think it's a huge problem, and I don't think it's a problem proportional to the number of attention it's been given in the British press. If you have a child that comes out as trans to you and they want to take hormones, they are much more likely to be happy with that decision than they ever are to regret it. The author also claims that this number is increasing as the number of people who go to gender identity clinics is increasing. Like I said, it's really hard to make any definitive claim about trends because we all have these different statistics measuring different groups and slightly different things. That being said, that same Swedish study that I mentioned had been conducted 17 years earlier. While in 1998, 3.8% of people expressed regret, in 2015 it had decreased to approximately 2%. This is a comparable study done by the same people in the same place with a similar sample size, and so it seems like the best chance we have to make any claim about trends, and it seems to be trending downwards. The number of people detransitioning seems to be decreasing as access to trans healthcare gets better. I've already mentioned that stories of detransition are often used to argue for harsher gatekeeping to trans healthcare. People say they were rushed into transition or that they should have been challenged more, and there's a national discussion on whether or not we should make access to trans healthcare more difficult. I'm really only going to focus on the UK here because number one, that's where the author's from, that's where a lot of these articles are coming from, and number two, that's where I'm from and so that's the system that I know well. The UK has something called the National Health Service, or the NHS, which is publicly funded but in the moment completely free to access medical care. In Scotland you don't even need to pay for prescriptions and so my entire transition was free. I didn't pay for my testosterone or my surgery, the doctors even reimbursed me for the hotel my parents stayed at while I had surgery. However, one of the drawbacks of the NHS, especially because now it's being underfunded, is that there are long wait times. There's only one gender identity clinic in the UK with wait times consistently under a year, and multiple of them often exceed two years. And this is just the wait to be referred. You're not getting prescribed hormones on that very first day. 
then you have to talk to a doctor multiple times and get blood tests before you're even considered for hormones. And if after all that, after two years of waiting to get to a clinic and after talking to a doctor, you still insist that you want hormones, that's on you if it turns out that it's not right for you. So I think the story of the NHS being incredibly reckless and just giving hormones out to any kid who says they might be trans is false. It's absolutely not how it happens. There are plenty of people who are very insistent that they're trans and still don't get access to hormones. While we're in kind of this fact-checking space, there's another point the author makes that I really want to get into. <laughs> so the author makes the claim that a lot of people transition because they are gay, they have internalized homophobia, and they want to become straight. Which is... I don't even know where to start with this one. Now, of course, she doesn't cite any sources, so I guess I will. I'll do all the fucking work, Joe. Firstly, the vast majority of trans people are not straight after they transition. In fact, according to a 2015 survey, only 15% of trans people identified as straight, with 16% identifying as gay, lesbian, or same gender attracted. The remaining 69%, nice, identified as bisexual, pansexual, asexual, or otherwise queer. Wow, it's almost like being trans gives you a complex understanding of the fluidity of gender and sexuality, and most people fall somewhere in the middle of a spectrum. The National Transgender Discrimination Survey surveyed nearly 3,000 trans women in the US, and similarly, their majority reported being attracted to other women, either identifying as strictly lesbian or bisexual, pansexual, and otherwise queer. The number of same gender attracted people was even higher amongst trans men. You know, the people the author says are just misguided lesbians. Most of them like dudes. The vast, vast majority of trans people aren't heterosexual after transition, and so the argument that they transition to become straight is just demonstrably false. It's also pretty ghoulish to make the claim that trans people transition to escape homophobia. It completely denies the very real and very dangerous transphobia people go through transphobia that you, Joe, are contributing to. I'm not gonna say that being a cis gay man is easier than being a straight trans man. Honestly, I really don't like comparing how hard it is to be a certain member of the LGBT community compared to another. That being said, the suicide rate of trans people is almost double that of cis LGB people. No gay person would say, wow, I'm so sick of being discriminated against, so I'm gonna become trans you know, one of the most vulnerable groups in the country. Painting being trans as the easy alternative to being gay is wrong and, quite frankly, disgusting. As we've already discussed, the vast majority of stories about detransitioners are cis people who mistakenly believed they were trans and then realised that they weren't. But this doesn't seem to be the biggest cause of detransition. Not by a long shot. Remember when I said that 8% of trans people surveyed by the National Centre for Transgender Equality reported detransitioning, and that we'd look at that number a little later on? It's later on now. Hi. So of that 8% who detransitioned, only 5% said that they did so because they realised transition wasn't the right path for them. That's only 0.4% of the overall sample of trans people. The most common reasons cited for detransition was pressure from a parent followed by the difficulty of transition, the discrimination they faced, and the other people they lost from their lives. And all of that 8%, 62% later re-transitioned, and are now living full-time as a gender other than the one they were assigned at birth. Most people who detransition do so due to societal pressure and transphobia, not because they were really cis all along. Being trans is hard, it's dangerous, it subjects you to a lot of hate, and so some people are able to live in the closet if it protects them from all of this. But while that works for a short amount of time, the vast majority of people later retransition when dysphoria once again becomes too much for them. I'm not saying that nobody detransitions because they were cis all along, or that there's never been any instances of medical malpractice where a doctor prescribed hormones to someone when it clearly wasn't the right path for them but I think those stories are being told disproportionately. It's being made to look like a much more prevalent problem than it really is. True stories can still be propaganda when they're the only stories being told. I feel a lot of sympathy for detransitioners, because I can relate to having a body that doesn't fit your desired gender expression. However, as already mentioned, detransitioners are a small, small minority of the people who take steps to medical transition. It is much more likely that a trans person would go through the wrong puberty than a cis person would ever accidentally take HRT. I myself have irreversible changes from my first puberty that no amount of hormones or surgery could ever fix. My dump truck ass is a curse. 
it's never leaving me. Detransitioners and trans people should be friends. We've gone through very similar experiences, and the fact that one group is being used to argue against the rights of another really doesn't sit right with me. One group gets a lot more sympathy from cis people. The thought that a cis person could accidentally live a trans experience is so much more horrifying than the thought that a trans person could be forced to live a cis experience. Julia Serrano has a really great quote about this. She says that authors often raise fears that some children, i.e. ones who are really cisgender in their minds, may be pushed into the wrong puberty, and thus may have to undergo expensive medical procedures to correct those bodily changes. But this precisely describes what a trans child would face if they were not allowed to transition until adulthood. If the former example concerns you, but the latter one doesn't, then that's a clear sign that you value cis bodies and lives over trans ones. And the crazy part is, there's a solution that helps everyone in this situation. Puberty blockers. If you're worried about kids making life-changing decisions about their body too quickly, I don't see why you wouldn't support puberty blockers. They give everyone the chance to make up their mind, and they're completely reversible. Unless, you know, this is less about actually wanting kids to have the time to make their own decision about their bodies, and more about denying access to trans healthcare, no matter what it is. <laughs> I remember a conversation I had with a friend one time who was moving to a very conservative part of the US, and we were talking about how much of a difference it would be from Edinburgh, which is quite a liberal left-leaning place, especially in comparison to America. And we were talking about arming school teachers with guns, because at the time that was kind of the big national conversation, and I immediately jumped to my tirade of being like, these people are idiots or they're selfish, there's no other option. And my friend said, well, we want the same thing, which is to protect kids, we just disagree on what the best way to do that is, and we have to acknowledge we're coming from a place of a shared goal before we can have any meaningful conversations about solutions. And so that's what I'm doing. I want the same thing as the author. To an extent. I want everybody to be comfortable in their own body, I want everybody to be able to make truly informed decisions about their medical care, and I want everybody who chooses to transition to be happy and thrive. To put it plainly, I want to decrease the number of detransitioners. So how do we do that? The solution often argued for is harder gatekeeping. Harsher rules about who and who cannot access medical transition, and ultimately just a longer and more difficult process. However, gatekeeping has never actually stopped people from transitioning. In her book Whipping Girl, Julia Serrano talks about how, back when it was even harder to access medical transition, a lot of people just lied about their experiences or DIY'd outside of the system. One of the most popular people on YouTube who talk about their detransition at length is Elle Palmer, and in one of her videos she talks about how when she had a therapist who didn't want to allow her to transition, she simply quit and found another therapist who did want her to transition. This is someone who came up against gatekeeping and simply found another gate. At a certain point, if someone is truly determined about what they want, there's no way to stop them without also stopping the trans people who actually do need it. And let's be very clear here, that's what the author wants. They don't actually care about detransitioners, they want to make the process of medical transition harder for everyone, across the board, because they're, guess what? transphobic. They want fewer trans people in the world. That's it. Detransitioners are a Trojan horse, they don't care about them. But I think that's a minority of people in this conversation. I really want to believe that the vast majority of people who are concerned about detransitioners are so because they're compassionate. So how do we actually help? How do we make sure that people who transition don't end up regretting that decision? Number one, puberty blockers. If someone is young or they're not entirely sure about their decision, if you give them puberty blockers, their natural puberty will be stopped and they'll be given enough time to decide whether or not they want to have hormones. If they don't, they stop taking puberty blockers, their natural puberty goes on as normal, everything's chill. Decrease the emphasis on medical transition. Start celebrating trans people who don't medically transition. The acceptance and the safety of a trans person is often contingent on them having medical transition, and so it's no surprise that so many trans people are so desperate to have hormones and surgery. You can't simultaneously say that people are being pushed into medical transition too fast and completely shit on any trans person who doesn't want to medically transition or hasn't done it to your own standards. More information about what transition does to you. The author and other transphobes want to make the argument that we shouldn't talk to trans kids about hormones, but I think the opposite would be more helpful if we tell everyone exactly what transition's gonna do to them and exactly what their body's gonna go through, they'd be able to make properly informed decisions. 
And the biggest one, the most obvious one, is make being trans easier so fewer people regret it. As already mentioned, the biggest cause of detransition is transphobia. If you want to stop people detransitioning, fight transphobia. So the narrative of detransitioners is a constructed narrative. While all of these individual stories are true, they are being told out of proportion and other stories are being ignored to create a certain narrative of vulnerable people being tricked by trans people into transitioning when it's not the right path for them. In reality, the story is much more complicated. Most trans people don't regret their transition and they feel a lot happier having taken medical steps to transition. If you're trans or if your child is trans, I really wouldn't worry. Most trans people feel so much happier. Once again, the biggest cause of detransition is transphobia. A part of me doesn't see the point in taking the author's statement and picking out individual arguments and trying to disprove them because she doesn't believe what she's saying. She never cites any sources. Her arguments are crafted using literally false information. She's hoping that other people won't do the research. She's arguing bad faith and she's also not gonna see this video. But I'm making this video for other people who may have read her statement and thought it sounded reasonable because she's crafted herself to sound reasonable if you don't look into any of the claims that she's making. Unless you're really clued in on discussions in the trans community, you might not pick up on any of the hateful rhetoric that she's using. So I wanted to take those people on good faith and really believe that with a nuanced argument and informed points, hopefully I could change a couple of people's minds or at least put some people's fears to rest. Thank <laughs> you.